take Tiffany to get all pretty tonight? Let's compare. Five minutes. Five minutes. Oh Don't you just want to punch her? <laughs> I had to start on Tuesday, Tiffany. Oh, there's a lot of stuff I gotta do. I gotta tape stuff and talk and stuff. And I gotta go to the spa. It's expensive to be old, Tiffany. Get it all done. I got it all done at the Bellagio Spa last Tuesday. It cost me a fortune. I was there all day. Got the sandblasting and the spackle. Ever get your butt spackled, Tiffany? Nah. Then I went in there, the first thing the guy starts doing, he's walking around me with a mirror. Oh, you got rust. I'm a single gal, I'm a single gal. Where are my single eligible men in the crowd? Over there. How old are you? 21! Ooh, that's a, that's a little old. What's your name, honey? Tom. Tom. Did you ever have sex with a red-headed comedian before? Carrot Top doesn't count, Tom. That was, of course, the hilarious Kathleen Dunbar, and I am thrilled to have her today as a guest on Las Vegas Diaries. I'm Kilio. welcome to my channel. If you haven't already, please subscribe and go ahead and hit the like button before we get started. I am super excited today to have my friend Kathleen Dunbar. Kathleen is a headlining Las Vegas comedian. She has worked all over the strip at all the biggest comedy clubs here in Las Vegas. I had the pleasure of working with Kathleen when we worked at the Sin City Comedy Club that used to be at Planet Hollywood Casino. We also toured with that show on Celebrity Cruises. I have lots of great memories with Kathleen and I am so excited that she was able to join me today for Las Vegas Diaries. I hope you enjoy this interview with Kathleen Dunbar. Welcome back to Las Vegas Diaries. I'm here with my hilarious guest, Miss Kathleen Dunbar. Hi, Kathleen. Hi, how are you, Kel? I'm great. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Anytime. Anytime for you, babe. I wanted to um, start with your, basically your background. And if I remember correctly, you kind of got a late start into comedy, correct? I, yes, I did. Can you tell I us did. about that and how, how you got started as a comedian? Well, um, you know, I was always, always loved comedy as a little girl. Um, I always loved good comics as a little girl I used to watch the Merv Griffin show or the Tonight Show and the best part was always watching the comedians, but I never thought I'd ever be a comedian. And then when I got into junior high school and high school, I, I was kind of the, the little uh, stereotypical, but it, I was kind of the class clown. I was the goofy one trying, because I was a horrible student. <laughs> um, I wasn't going to impress anybody with my answers for number seven. Nobody would ever cheat off of my paper, but um, a smart ass comeback that would be me. I was kind of a smart ass. But then um, got married, had a baby, and got jobs, got a divorce, and raising a child alone. And then uh, when my son was a teenager, I started going to these shows in Milwaukee. I grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, it was called Comedy Sports. It was a uh, started by a brilliant man called Dick Chudnow. Dick Chudnow was a very funny guy. Um, and he started this uh, improv troupe called Comedy Sports. And we would go see the shows and laugh and laugh and laugh. It was just brilliant, just great. And then at the end of the shows, he would say, uh, by the way, you can take Comedy Sports class and you too can be an improv artist. If you know." And they picked their performers out of this class so all my friends are like oh my gosh you should take this class and i'm like no because if i take this class somebody's going to actually expect me to really be funny and it just terrified me to actually really do it so then a guy that i was working with who was not funny um this this kleenex here is more funny than this guy was <laughs> Anyway, he started taking the class and then he would come into work and go, oh my God, I'm so funny. I'm so hysterical. I can't believe this class is so much fun. And everybody's telling me that 
I should become one of the professional artists because I'm so good. And I went, all right, all right, bullshit. I'm, uh, I'm going to go down and sign up for the class. So I went down and I signed up for the class. And six weeks later, Dick Chudnell picked me to be one of his professional performers in their live performance shows. Um, and it was really a shock because I didn't even know all the games. They have probably 30 to 40 different improv games that they play. I knew maybe 10. And, um, but I, it was just this astonishing, I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I can't believe this happened to me. Well, I did that for a couple of years. And then I ended up getting an audition at a dinner theater place. Oh, it was so, it was so lame. It was so bad. <laughs> but I was a character actress and I would get killed and then come back at the end of the play as a Catholic nun and help figure out who the murderer was in the murder mystery show. So you're out there with just these old, we found these old Catholic jokes in some old comedy book from like vaudeville. The jokes were horrible and corny and hacky, but I kind of developed my confidence and my timing. So I did that for about six years. So now I'm, I'm old. I won't say how old, cause then you'll be able to figure out how old I am now. But um, I was old. My son was, um, you know, just about getting ready to move out and go out on his own. And then a girlfriend of mine said, there's an open mic at this bar. Uh, down the street you should go you'd be great I go you mean stand up she goes yeah I said oh I, I can't do that you have to write all your own material you have to write it all and perf just go down there it would be fun so I went down there and I signed up and three weeks later I was opening at a comedy club for Emo Phillips it went that quick and that was February 4th 1999 and in 2002, I moved to Las Vegas, and the rest is history. <laughs> Why Las Vegas? Why not LA or New York or something? Well, I, I kind of thought about New York. And I think the reason I didn't go to New York is because it probably five million comics in New York. All brilliant, all really good. That's the heart of stand-up. And it's in a very expensive city to live. I was an adult. You know, I had a home, I had a three bedroom home and a car. And I think to move to New York, I wouldn't have been able to afford that. I didn't go to LA because I just never felt that LA vibe. Vegas just seemed right to me. I had a girlfriend, my very best friend, Bonnie. Bonnie DeLu, hi Bonnie, she's in uh, Milwaukee. She's the one who introduced me to Vegas. She brought me here, we went here on a vacation, a girl's weekend. And then she said to me, we should move here. We're single, we're old, we're still good looking. We should come to Vegas, wouldn't that be fun? And I thought, I'm in. I'm tired of the snow and the cold. Um, I was ready for an adventure in my life, you know. And then I sold my condo and I said, okay, we're going to Vegas, right? And she's like, well, I don't know if I can quite do it yet. I'm gonna have to wait a little while. I go, well, I'm going. I'm not gonna wait for you, I'm gonna go. And I've been here 18 years. She still hasn't come. <laughs> She's still back in Milwaukee. That reminds so if me. If I waited for her, I never would have come out here. You know. My my question is, um, I was going to ask you this anyway, but you segued into it perfectly. So you've lived in Vegas for 18 years, like you said. Do you plan on staying in Las Vegas? Not like, leaving. Never. Not leaving. And then what is so? What is your what is it you love about Vegas? Why don't you want to leave? I think I I love the people. I just love the people here. I wasn't expecting that. I was expecting when I moved here to be, it was gonna be harder than it was. Um, everybody here, I don't know, maybe I'm sounding crazy, but it seems like the people that move here, that come here from wherever, and they're great because they come from all over the country, as you know, all over the world, they're just a little bit more adventurous. They're just a little bit more, people that move here have a little bit more spunk to them. A little bit more, no time for BS. I've met a lot of BS people in the business, but I don't know. They're just more down to earth and more real and more cool people. That, that's been my experience. I've just met some wonderful, wonderful people here and have had some great experiences. And 
I also fell in love with the desert. Wasn't expecting that. I thought the desert was going to be something I was just going to tolerate. And now, I mean, I, if I can move this out to my patio, I got a bunch of cactus on my patio. I just, I love the desert. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not leaving. Uh, where would I go? Where do you go after this? I don't know. Where would I move to? <laughs> I don't know, but I love it, and I agree. I love the desert, too. I've never heard you, anyone describe it that way about people being spunky, and you are very right. So, okay, let me get back to your comedy. What Can you tell us what your creative process is like when you're coming up with your stand-up? Are you a writer? Does it just kind of come to you? How does it work for you? Uh, I'm not a good writer. There are people that I know write every day. Uh, I wish I did that. I don't. I have to be inspired by something. I have to see something or somebody says something or I say something accidentally or there's something on the television or something that you see that you go, oh my gosh, that's so funny. I'm going to write a bit about that. I'm going to write material about that. Um, that's how I create comedy. I have a hard time writing at home in the bedroom or in the office, but I write on stage. Like I'll have a premise or an idea about like, for instance, I just, right before the shutdown, I was working on this new joke. It's about the fact that I, I, I have mom pants. Okay, Kelly. Um, these are old lady mom pants. I don't have the elastic waist, but they're pretty much mom pants. And mom pants don't have pockets. And even when I buy jeans, the pockets are fake pockets. So I have nowhere to put my cell phone. And if I put it in my purse, forget it about it, it's gone. Because my purses, I have old mom purses. They're big. And it's going to be underneath probably a mattress cover and maybe a calendar. And you don't, under the things I have in my purse, I can't find my phone. So I find I started putting my phone, you know, in my, in my, in my bra here. Yeah. Um, There's always plenty of room. <laughs> so I've been doing that, but I accidentally keep boob dialing people <laughs> and this happened I was actually at the grocery store and my phone was in my bra and I heard this hello <laughs> hello and the and the checkout lady goes that's your that's your boob <laughs> and I went oh oh my god so I quick grabbed the phone out and it's my best friend Bonnie back in Milwaukee and she goes why do you keep calling me I go I'm not she goes you just called me three times within the last 15 minutes and then you hang up on me. I said, I'm sorry, I'm boob dialing you by accident. So I came up with this whole thing that, you know, and eventually the joke was, um, I promise I'll stop boob dialing you. I won't do it anymore. But if I get cold, I might send you a text. <laughs> so, you know, things like that will inspire me to, you know, I can find humor in that. I can find humor in that. There are some things I don't find humor in. Trust me, I've got a box full of little pieces of paper of jokes that I've written down. And then you go, oh, that's so funny. And then the next day you look at it and you go, that's not funny. I can't think of anything funny about that. So it's a process of uh, trial and error, trial and error. Inspiration, I think, is my best friend for coming up with funny comedy. That reminds me, um, you and I used to work at Sin City Comedy together, where I was a dancer and you, of course, were a comedian. I, a huge stand-up fan, always have been, but I'm not naturally funny like that. I remember sitting in the audience with you. I don't remember which comedian we were laughing. I'm pretty sure we were enjoying them. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we were enjoying them, though. And you said something along the lines of that there are comic comics comics that are especially funny to other comedians. And yes. I also remember you saying that, that it's really hard to make a comedian laugh. And that you said something along the lines of, you'll, you'll, you'll watch a comedian and you'll really enjoy their comedy, but you'll just say something like, that's funny. And so exactly. That's funny. I've, I've done that. I've sat in the back of very good friends and they're hysterical. And this is my reaction. Oh my God, that's hysterical. <laughs> yeah. But there are certain comics that make me bend over out loud laugh. That's rare. Um, I'm not saying they're any better than the other comics. It just for some reason, those are the ones that get me. And there are some comics that I work at. You work at a club for seven nights, you'll do two shows every night. 
I'll watch every one of their shows because I'm like, I love that comic so much. Um, I, I have to not miss one word, not one drop. I've got to catch it all. That's rare too. There are comics I know that are very, very funny, but I won't always do that. But I absolutely love their comedy, respect them. But there's probably five, six out there right now. And I won't mention their names because I don't want to be rude to the ones that are not on my list. I was just going to ask you who your favorite comedians are, but if you don't want to say that, could you say maybe who inspired you? Maybe some of the the bigger name comedians that inspired you? Yeah, when I was a little girl, I remember watching uh, a very funny Vegas woman comedian. She's since passed away. Toadie Fields. She was a little short, Jewish, adorable, funny, kind kind of on the heavy side. She always made fun of her weight. I remember as a little girl, she'd do this joke. She'd go, I'm trying to lose, this is the 60s, okay? She goes, I'm trying to lose weight, and they got me doing this. Look, I do this for 20 minutes every day. Look how thin, look how thin. And it cracked me up. So Joan Rivers, Joan Rivers was a huge inspiration to me because she was a smart ass. You know, she had a smart ass comment about everything, which is why they had her doing those, um, red carpet, uh, red carpet events where she would make fun of people's clothes and how they looked. It was hysterical. Um, Johnny Carson, I love Johnny Carson, Don Rickles, uh, Rodney Dangerfield on my hero, George Carlin. George Carlin was brilliant. His, his use of words was brilliant to me as a young teenager watching how he used words was inspirational to me. It was like, oh my God, he'd come up with these things. Brilliant, just a brilliant, uh, again, a brilliant writer, you know? And when he passed away, I think he had nine to 10 hours of, of specials, all different, all killer material. Um, I want to show you something. When you said George Carlin, one second. I have an autographed George Carlin. Oh, I love that. And this was a gift from um, my my good friend Randy, who was the 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 head security at Jubilee for since 1984 until the show closed. And he used to escort all the big celebrities in the showrooms at Bally's and MG when it was MGM and, and when it was Bally's. And he became um, friends with George Carlin. And so he wrote this. He used to call him the Orb Officer, and then his initials. And so he he gave this to my friend Randy, and Randy gave it to me. Because oh, how much well, I love George Carlin, which I felt I, it's just one of my favorite favorite possessions. So I thought I'd show that to you. Oh, well, I was blessed. I got to meet him. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, uh, a really good friend of mine, Dennis Blair, used to open for him, and I met Dennis Blair here in Las Vegas. And I said, "Oh my God, you kidding me? You opened for Carlin, my hero. He's unbelievable." And he goes, "Well, would you like tickets? Would I like tickets?" And he was performing at the MGM, um, the big concert room. Um, I don't know what the right name of it is. And um, so we got there and the showroom was completely filled out. So we had to go to the light booth guy. So we had to go up like this spiral in the back of the room, up this spiral staircase. And you're sitting in this tiny room where it looked out way over the audience and then way down there was the stage. And you sat on these couches and right next to you is the big spotlight guy. And we sat there and we watched George's set. And he, of course, was brilliant. And I was in awe. And then the security guard took us back down the spiral case to the backstage to go meet Dennis. And Dennis showed me his green room where they have all this food for him and sodas and waters, whatever you would want. It was so fancy and so cool. And then I said to him, I go, well, is George here? And he goes, well, no, he never stays. He always leaves right after the show. And I was like, damn it. And then from the far right, you could hear like a soda can pop, you know? And the security guard standing there goes, he's still here. And then Dennis went, oh, let me go. And then he walks away and he goes, George? Yeah, he goes, you want to come out and meet some of my friends? And he walked out and I just started crying. <laughs> I was like such a dork. I'm like, oh my God, it's so great to meet you. I can't believe I met you. I used to watch you all the time. Every time we had Johnny Carson, we're allowed to stay up late because I'm still in high school. But we would sneak downstairs and turn on the TV and turn on Johnny Carson and watch your set. And poor George must have been like, oh my God, lady, shut up, you know. 
And then I said to him, I said, I'll never forget the time you did a joke with my brother's name. And he goes, I did a joke with you. What's your brother's name? I go, Mark Dunbar. And he goes, oh, I remember that joke. And he does the joke. And I went, <laughs> we're such a dork. And then he said, don't you have your own show here in Vegas? That's when I had my, um, the Divas of Comedy show at the Sahara. And I says, yeah, yeah. Do you want to come? <laughs> I got my show. And he goes, well, no, my, and I think it was his second wife. He goes, is trying to do stand up. Could she come down and do, do some time in your show? I go, absolutely. Here's my card. So I gave him like 10 of my cards. He never called, but for the next three months, every time my phone rang, I would say, I have to get that. That could be George Carlin. <laughs> okay. So, so I have cute. a picture of that on my Facebook, a picture of me and George together on my Facebook. Oh, so. I'm gonna, do you mind if I put it in this video? Absolutely. Okay, I'm gonna find it. That's amazing that he recognized your name from headlining at the Sahara, is that what it was? No, you see, I think, I think Dennis must have said something to him, the effect of she's got her own show here in town, it's an all woman show, it was all women comedians. So that must have been something that he remembered. Yeah, how cool is that, you know? So yeah, he was, when, when he went, it was it devastated me, you know. Yeah. Um, he was incredible, incredibly talented, uh, incredibly talented man. So yeah, so those were my inspirations. Now, you know, Dave Chappelle is incredible. There's a woman comic in, uh, in New York named uh, Jessica Kirshen that just kills me. She's hysterical. She's just balls to the walls, hysterical. I just love her. Um, a lot of guys, you know, I love Brad Garrett, Brad Garrett's club at the MGM. I've worked with him many times. Hysterical guy, wonderfully funny. A lot of the comics I work with at the Comedy Cellar, you know, brilliant comics coming in all the time and doing spots. So I'm very lucky. I'm, I've been very blessed. I've been very blessed and uh, I love my life. I just want to get back to work. You, you are really good at what you do and you're up there with the best of them. So like you said, you worked with Brad Garrett many times. I know you've worked at his comedy club, you've worked with him. And you've also opened for some really big comedians like Bill Maher and Ar Ar Arsenio Hall. Am I missing anybody else? It's um, let's see. That's about it. Arsenio, Bill Maher was an uh, interesting contract. He doesn't use an opening act, but the head of entertainment over at Boyd Gaming said he's got to fly here after taping his HBO show. And if there's any delay, we're going to be in trouble. So I need a 30 minute buffer. Would you come in and, and open for him? And I got a lot of people told me, oh, he's not gonna be very nice to you. Bill was actually very nice to me, barely talked to me. But I went out on that stage that night and I just really had a good show. I really had a good show. It was one of those magic nights. And as I walked off the stage, I walked right by Bill and he looked at me and he said, well, they certainly liked you, didn't they? <laughs> well, I said, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, they're waiting for you, Bill. Just go get them. But, um, and Arsenio Hall was an absolute sweetheart. What a nice man. What a, and, and again, what an incredible career that man has had. Um, you know, again, I, I don't know. I've not had too many bad experiences with people bad in the business. I've had a couple, but, you know, there's bad people in every walks of life, in any a job or career. Um, most of the ones I've met, even the big stars. I've, I remember years ago sitting down at the Stardust uh, Lounge. And you know who came in and sat down at our table and hung out with us all night? Tony Bennett. Really? Yeah. Because there was a man performing there in the lounge, guy's name is Bob Anderson, that Tony was a fan of and loved and they were good friends. And I was like, oh my God. And that was way before Facebook or Twitter. So I couldn't even let anybody know. And I didn't get a picture because I didn't have a cell phone. You know, cell phones didn't have cameras back then. It's back in the, what they call the olden days. And, uh, but yeah, I've met, I've met some, I've met some wonderful uh, stars. It's been a lot of fun. I want to ask you, you mentioned that you 
were the host, the headliner for a show at the Sahara that was all female comedians. I, like I mentioned, have been a huge stand-up fan my whole life. When I was a kid, I was always disappointed that there weren't more female comedians. And I don't know if you still hear this a lot, but I, I remember I used to hear people all the time saying that women aren't funny, which I used to really bother me. Um, so my question for you is, what do you have to say to people that think that women aren't funny? And also, have you experienced any sexism in the industry or just from being a female comic? Uh, yeah, a lot of sexism in the industry. Um, I'll call a club up and I'll say, uh, you know, you wanted me to give my avails. You want to get me in your room. Uh, the only week I'm available, you know, is the week of the 17th. And then the guy will say, well, we, we already had a woman comic the week before that. So we can't have. And I'm like, wow, that still goes on. But I don't let it bother me. It's part of the business. I don't think it's right. I should get out of the business. It's just the way it is. Um, I've had many. And I know they're trying to be complimentary when they say, you know, for a woman, you're actually funny. And I go, you know, thank you. You know, what do you say? You just got to be. So I've, I've heard that many times. I don't like women comics, but I like you. You know, like, that's supposed to make me happy. <laughs> so, yeah, that I hear that a lot. It's like we're some weird. And it's kind of odd because there's a lot of really fantastic women comedians out there. I mean, look at Tina Fey in the movie she's made, Amy Schumer. You know, there's a lot of brilliant women out there right now kind of owning the business really kicking ass and doing some great some great comedy um but there's still you know there's still a little bit of that you know and it's funny because if i say anything about say one of my body parts oh my gosh i can't believe you said that yet they'll go and they'll listen to a man comic talking about his parts and the things he does to them um, all night long and that's hysterical so there's still that little bit of a like we're supposed to all just be little coquette ladies you know <laughs> and we're not <laughs> uh, that's that's I'm on it's definitely disheartening to hear that that still goes on but I guess I'm not really surprised and it's it's silly too because I feel like these people that say that there aren't funny female comedians they just don't watch enough stand-up or they're not really versed in stand-up if they actually think that there's there's a lot um and you're definitely one of them Thank um, you. so my last question for you my last guest was my friend danny who's the host over at crazy girls and she is aspiring to be a comedian she's just just getting started because as a host she found that she had a knack for comedy and is actually really funny and she's she's kind of like cutting her teeth in the stand-up world so to speak so what do you have, um, what is your advice for people like my friend Danny or to anybody else that is an aspiring comedian? Okay, the, the key to stand up, what I, what helped me and you know, what, what works for me, I can only talk about what works for me, is get as much stage time as you can. Don't edit yourself. And don't try to write comedy that you think everybody's going to find funny. If you're a real comedian, you already know what's funny. Just open up your mouth and let it out. Um, I, you know, sometimes I've got to rewrite a joke for weeks before it gets the right way. Weeks. Um, but you just start ranting and get it out. Tell her to get as much stage time as she can. I know when I started, I was trying to do what I thought everybody would find funny. I really didn't find my own voice. Maybe we all need to go through that for a year or two or three or four before we really find our voice, which the business talks about that. The comedy business says, oh, he's only been doing it eight years. He quite hasn't found his voice yet. And what they mean by that is your real true point of view, your real original take on the world. And the fact that she's a dancer in a production show in Las Vegas, nobody else is doing that. So she would have an incredible point of view that I can't have or the other girl comics I know in town can't have because of what she's doing. So take all of that and run with that. Um, 
write, 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 you know, rewrite it, rewrite it, test it, get stage time. There's a lot of open mics in Las Vegas. There's a lot of places that she can go and get some stage time. You, you know, you start befriending some of these local comics that will recommend another open mic to you. And if she gets good, let me know. I can use it. She's already really good, so I'm sure she's going to get amazing. Um, thank you so much. Where can people, I know that everything's still kind of shut down, but where can people find you doing comedy in Las Vegas when things reopen? Well, if you go to my website, which is funnydunbar.com, uh, if you go there right now and look, you'll just see uh, cancel, 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 cancel. Um, I don't have a lot booked for the fall because nobody's been booking. None of the clubs are booking because of the shutdown. We really don't know when we're going to open. Uh, currently, the only thing I have on the books that is a real gig that's going to happen is the end of July. Uh, I will be headlining at the Laugh Factory in Reno at the Silver Legacy. But they still have not opened up the showrooms. Casino's open, I think. I think the casino's open. But they haven't opened up any showrooms yet. Now, a little bird told me. <laughs> don't tell anybody. <laughs> that they're looking at the first week of July to opening the showrooms back up here in town. That's just a rumor. I don't have, and I'm not gonna mention any names. But um, uh, there's a couple of rooms I think that might be opening up, but it's gonna be tough and go because they're gonna be at probably half capacity. And I don't know how people are gonna make any money at that, but I'm dying to get back on stage. I haven't told a joke for three months. It's gonna take me three, four shows just to remember all my, my stuff. You know, I've got some new stuff I've been playing with, but I don't find a whole lot of what's going on right now real funny. <laughs> so I'm not too inspired right now, but um, um, yeah, so funnydunbar.com. You can catch me, hook me up on that website with uh, Twitter and uh, Facebook and Instagram. I'm more of a Facebook girl than Twitter and Instagram, but um, I look forward to seeing you soon, girl. Me too. And guys, all of those links will be in the description box below so you can go follow Kathleen and make sure you check her out when you are in Las Vegas. Kathleen, thank you so much for being on Las Vegas Diaries. You are hilarious. Thank you for having me, beautiful. Anytime. Mwah. Bye. Love you. Love you. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Kathleen. Don't forget her website and all of her social media links are in the description box below. Also, don't forget to give me a follow over on social media. That way you can stay up to date on all of my upcoming guests and ask them a question before I do my interviews so you can get your own personal questions in for my Las Vegas entertainment guests. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to share this video with anyone you think might enjoy it and I'll see you guys in the next video.